five minutes after start time, it's a good time to get started in human terms. Um, we welcome everybody who is joining us this morning. Um, we were gonna be really happy if we'd had 40 to 50 folks uh, join us for this session. So we're kind of blown away that instead we have over 40, 450 people who have actually registered. And this was after our trying to take pains to carefully craft language. So we're really trying to make sure that people with lived experience, that's the target group that this is aimed at. So um, what it shows is there's just been a lot of change in the recent years, uh, probably because of the peer support movement. But um, I will tell you that it's like, it's like watching time catch up with a vision that some of us had. Um, I know I've already seen one or two of the folks that we've been doing advocacy in North Carolina for 20 years, but um, it's, just, it's just an amazing moment. So I wanted to, before we get started, thank um, Damie Jackson Jopp and Karen Gross who have with me been planning this and, and also Charlene Boyette, Char's been assisting too, but especially Ann Rodriguez, who, uh, whom we reached out to to see if she would help us with this information. And y'all may not know, but Ann is the director of the Eye to Eye Center for Integrative Health. If you wanna learn more about them, you can just go to uh, lowercase i, number two, lowercase i, eye to eye center.org. And, um, and basically what they have become, they've kind of morphed their roles, just like a lot of us have through the years, um, to become kind of a convener of ideas and uh, innovators to try to bring change. And they also try to keep our service provider group and our service management groups informed about some of the processes that are being developed um, as giving mental health substance use and uh, IDD care um, is, is that's changing too. So we see them as a potential partner for helping to catalyze movement <laughs> with regard to mental health recovery, because as many know, we don't have a real mental health recovery agenda um, through our state mental health system. And so we thank Anne so much for her um, contributions today. We will be recording this because there are people who've reached out who could not come but really wanted the information. So we, we announced that early as people were getting on, but it is currently being recorded. Um, if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat box and we will try to be sure those questions get fielded and some of them will be asked during the meeting. Those that don't get asked, we will save the chat so that we can hopefully get back to folks with specific information if it looks pretty you know, urgent. Otherwise, I'll let you know that we're going to continue to have presentations um, because Peer Voice North Carolina, while we are a network and not actually a, a, an organization, so to speak, um, we know that through technology and through sharing ideas and building consensus around things, we can get a lot done. We've already seen that happen through Peer Voice North Carolina in the last. Um, about year and a half, I guess, we have formed online working groups using Facebook. And so there are several different coalitions that are already doing activity in areas like uh, peer run wellness centers, um, peer justice initiative. There's just a lot of different uh, efforts going on right now. And it's because peer voice is kind of a convener of, of people's voices. So we can help bring language and change into North Carolina. So Peer Voice NC is a SAMHSA funded network. It is a peer network, mostly aimed at people with mental health or mental health and substance use challenges. And we thank Shereen Carrico, who's on this meeting, who wrote the proposal to SAMHSA a couple of years ago to where we could get this going. So um, what we're gonna be doing, we are, using this opportunity to kick off a, um, the PVNC um, advocacy, peer advocacy coalition. And so in February, we're gonna have a meeting and we'll send the date out on that, on uh, how to build a relationship with your legislator um, and what kind of messaging is really effective and kind of reaching the legislators and helping them think differently about our lives and our issues and our needs. 
So it'll be about messaging and that will also include the importance of telling your story effectively and briefly in a way that has real impact on a legislator's thinking. So that'll be uh, what um, happens in February. In March, we're gonna have Ann return to talk about advocacy with the state, with the Department of Health and Human Services, with the Division of Mental Health. Um, so we felt like there was just so much good information but to put it all in one PowerPoint would be at one setting would just be too much. So today we're going to focus more on the legislation, legislation, legislature, the General Assembly. But in March, we will look at um, how to advocate in, in Raleigh with the Department of Health and Human Services. So well, those things are planned for right now, and um, we're looking forward to that. In 2004, just to kind of explain how I fit into all this. I received a call from somebody um, at the Yaganville Department of Social Services. She would not leave her name because she was nervous about calling, but she had somehow heard that I would speak out on things. And she told me that their town hall was about to pass an ordinance that would not allow people to leave the grounds of um, the adult care home, one of the large adult care homes there. And she wanted me to know that there was a meeting being held. And I, I, I went to Yadkinville to, to go to this meeting. But what I saw, because I visited this home before the meeting, was that this was a place that housed, um, it housed, I think, 110 people. And there were three staff working. And a lot of these people were young people that you knew if they had a really good act team or peer support or other services could live independently. And it just shocked me to realize, and I found out later, we had about 7,000 of our brothers and sisters living in adult care homes in North Carolina at the time. And so um, that's what kind of triggered me getting involved and going to Raleigh and talking to legislators. And I had to learn things. I learned a lot of it from Verla Insco. She literally taught me how to use the web. She, she taught me a lot of things. But what's happened since then is that I've become a person that some of these legislators will reach out to with a question or to get clarification or to just get my thinking on things. And you know, the, the thing is, is th through all those years, I had remained pretty much a lone voice. And um, now I don't have to be a lone voice anymore because we have all of you folks and our voices matter so much because we have unique expertise. And I don't have to say much more about that, we, our personal experiences. We have passion for fair and helpful treatment or services. We have a passion for that that nobody else can, can have. We have a passion for accountability. As one of my peers told me years ago, if my life matters to them, they will make sure the dollars are buying things that help me and not things that hold me back or things that don't help me. So for us as peers, we really think accountability is real important. And guess what? Legislators do too. And we'll talk more about that in future times. Um, and then finally, because we are not professional advocates, it's gotten to a place where some legislators just turn on their heels when they see somebody coming from certain organizations because they know it's gonna be about money and it's gonna be about meeting their organization's needs or whatever. They really wanna hear new voices talking to the real problems and how we can get solutions on the streets and in our communities and in our rural areas. So this is why our voices are, have never been as important as they are now because things aren't as, have never been as critical as they are now as far as supporting people toward recovery. So all this having been said, um, I'm just delighted to, to have introduced Anne and what's about to happen. We will have a, um, a biological break midway through this. And um, so let's learn and then let's go make change. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, let me see if I can pull my screen up here and share it with you. Everybody, I hope, can see that. And we'll get the slideshow going. Okay. All right. Um, Lori set this up perfectly. Uh, it, I'm so glad that she said it um, because what I, I look at 
is today that I'm I'm offering you my experience in learning about the legislative process and the policy process and all of the ways that you can um, really understand and keep it up to date. Um, but with the purpose of it being that your voice is the most important voice, in my opinion. And so helping you to find a comfort level to become an advocate, um, a strong advocate and feel confident in your message and what you what you can say and what you your your perspective is. So let's see if I can, yeah. So she mentioned, um, and I always say this to people, I'm a policy wonk. I found that that was my avocation. Early on, I worked in the US Senate and that's where I decided I really loved policy. But I also got to understand the legislative process. Uh, I really understood how legislators think. And then when I came to North Carolina working in a member association, I learned even more about that policy side of it and how there are steps that carry through to then what we see in our communities and the services that we receive. But advocacy really needs to start at that first level, that beginning level of when they're thinking about what are issues, what are challenges that we have in our state. And that's where your voice is so important. And so today it's really focusing on um, giving you some resources and helping you kind of get that comfort level to really be impactful early in the process of formulating legislation and things that really play out in the communities. Um, Lori mentioned about eye to eye being a convening agency. We do that um, because our goal is to really have everybody who is at the table, every perspective be seen in a level way. And um, that's really important to us. And so I'm so glad to be here today with you. And I'm gonna start off with a quote that I just love. Um, Lily Tomlin is a comedian and she said, I always wondered why somebody doesn't do something about that. Then I realized I was somebody. And I think that that's just a really good start to where we're gonna go today. We're gonna talk in the first half about legislation and how you can impact legislation. Take that little break. And then we're going to really talk uh, more about collaboration and how that can help you in advocacy. So let's start on legislation. Let's start with what, um, sorry, I was getting this, uh, something off my screen. Um, what is advocacy? So to advocate is to defend or promote a cause. It's an active um, thing that you do. It, it's not passive. You, you can't just sit by and watch what other people are doing. You're really getting out there and making sure your perspective is heard. So it goes beyond just shaping one piece of legislation or one part of policy. It's about systems change and systems change that makes it successful for all of us when it's in the community. Um, I do note that if you are with a nonprofit agency, you do have to kind of be careful about advocacy and lobbying. That could be a whole nother training session, but I just wanted to make sure I noted that. So I developed this slide um, just trying to think through my, my thought process. What, what do I think of when I know that legislation is being introduced? So the first thing is that they start with um, just coming up with what is that issue? What kind of improvement needs to be done? They identify that. Now, when I say they, I mean everybody. Um, legislators don't know everything. And in the state legislature, they don't have a staff like they do at the federal level. So oftentimes they do not know these issues as well as you do. And so you can impact it right at that level to go to a legislator and say, there's this issue going on and we think we know how to resolve it. This is what we're doing. That's what we're gonna talk about today, starting right at the very beginning. At that point, you have a very strong um, opportunity for impact. If you can see on the, the right side, I've kind of written where you're, how impactful you can be at that point. So you have a legislator who introduces the bill. Um, the bill is in either the House or the Senate, depending on whether it was a representative or a senator introducing it, and they refer it to the appropriate committee. And at that point, you still, you are having a very strong opportunity for impact. It's new, um, no one is familiar with it. Um, there needs to be a momentum to get it 
heard in committee. So then it, it gets to the committee level um, or there could be multiple committees that have to, to see that bill um, and they consider it and they am may amend it at that point. So uh, when a bill is introduced, it's not at all the final product often. Um, and there's opportunity to change it. So if you, if you see a bill that's introduced and you have a lot of concern about it, it's, that's your opportunity. You get in with legislators right then and say, these are our concerns. This is how we think it will play out in the community. Um, and that's a strong time to make some impact on, on the bill. Uh, once it's passed all the committees in either the House or the Senate, it goes to the floor of that body where it was introduced and it's either passed or it's sent back to committee. Sometimes it's amended at that point, but there's really not a huge amount of opportunity to impact it right at that point. If it passes, it goes over to the other body. If it started in the House, it goes over to the Senate. If it started in the Senate, it goes over to the House. And they go through the same process. It's referred to a committee or committees. It goes through those committees. It passes them. It goes to the floor. Um, not every bill does that. Some bills can't even get up um, in front of the committee. And that's why it takes advocacy and it takes that momentum from the community to really get bills going. Um, at that point, once it's passed, both the House and the Senate, you could very well have two different versions of the bill. So they have to conference together to figure out and negotiate what that final bill is going to look like. And so there may be a conference committee at that point that's appointed. Again, you have a strong opportunity for impact. If a, a piece got into the bill on the House side that you really like, you, make, you wanna make sure that you're advocating for that piece to get into that final bill if it didn't get into the Senate bill. So once it's passed both bodies, as I said, it either goes to the conference or it's passed then, and it goes on over to the governor for signature. Um, the governor has options. He can just sign the bill into law. He can veto it. And I know we have all heard about vetoes going on um, more in recently, and um, particularly as it relates to budget bills, or he can take no action at all. And then within 10 days, without his signature, that bill goes into law. The NC General Assembly runs on a two-year cycle for the budget, and they call that a biennium. They, they do have a session every year, but when they're in the first year of the biennium, it's called a long session, and it's simply because it's longer. It, go, it starts in January, and if they're really doing things well, it ends right before the beginning of the next fiscal year, which is July 1st. The second year of that biennium is called the short session. That's what we're heading into now. We've almost completed a long session and we'll go into a short session. And so their main goal during that time, other than other bills, is to develop that state budget for the two years. But at the beginning of the biennium, um, which is in that January start to a session, they have a fresh slate. There are no bills that were in the previous biennium that will be considered. They have to be reintroduced or new bills get introduced at that point. Um, so it's, it's all new. So we're going into a short session, but when the long session comes up in January of 2023, that's when that, that piece about having ideas about what can really improve things in the community is very key because all bills can be introduced, and if they pass certain hoops, they can last through that short session. So right now, they are technically still in session. <laughs> they have not adjourned from the long session that began in January of 2021. Um, they're working on the redistricting. They're working on some very focused things. They are not having regular meetings at this point, but presumably they will adjourn and then they will begin the short session on May, um, I think it's 13th of 2021. It's either the 13th or the 14th, I'm blanking right now. So as I said, the long session begins that budget process for the next two years. And during the long session, 
they will develop a state budget for both fiscal years. And um, they'll, that will start then that July 1st of the year that they're in session and go through to two years after that, two fiscal years. Um, they passed the budget this year that was started in the Senate. So it starts with an S, Senate Bill 105. I've given you a link to that. Um, it is a huge bill. So if you use the link, I just wanted to give you that tip that if you go up to your right corner and you find find and you put in a key search like um, mental illness um, or anything that you want to put in that's related to what you're looking at, schools, um, children, adults, you can then at least narrow down from there where the document has those words and go through it to really kind of find sections that might be of interest to you. Um, let's see, I think I went backwards, did I? No, okay. Um, after the General Assembly passes the bill, as I said, the governor signs it into law or he can veto it or he cannot sign it and it becomes law 10 days later. Um, and I also mentioned that the long session is when other bills can be introduced they have deadlines that that have to be met for them to remain active. Um, so once a bill is introduced, there's a, a deadline called crossover that if it if the bill doesn't this starts getting technical, but if the bill does not have funding in it, then it has to meet that crossover, which means that it has to pass the house that it was introduced in and go over to the other body uh, to remain active. If it doesn't pass that, then that bill does not remain active through the biennium. I got the date wrong. The short session begins on May 18th of this year. Um, so then for the budget, they don't just sit back and let that two-year budget that they developed just go on its way because sometimes things change. I think the pandemic is a very good example of that. Priorities change in the state. So the legislature comes back in in a short session, as they will do in May, and they'll look at what they developed for that second year of the budget biennium, and they'll do some changes. They call it tweaking, but sometimes it can be substantial changes. Sometimes it can be small changes, um, but they will make changes to the bills, the budget. It's another opportunity. If something has come up that's a priority for you to advocate and say, this has come up, you really need to focus on this. We might need a change in the budget for that. Um, so bills that were introduced in 2021 um, and met that crossover deadline are still alive in this coming up short session um, and remain active. And then bills that had that funding in it or appropriations also remain active. So right now they're sort of in what you would call an interim. And I used to think originally that the interim was just a downtime, um, but it is absolutely not a downtime. There are joint legislative committees that are only allowed to meet during the interim of two sessions. Um, and there are joint legislative committees that are meaningful to us. The um, Committee on Health and Human Services, the Committee on Medicaid and Health Choice, and the new committee that they've formed for improving health access and Medicaid expansion. That's new from the budget bill. They just created that. They just appointed the membership for that. And per the title, they're gonna be looking at Medicaid expansion, um, which is a huge issue in North Carolina. Many states have gone ahead and expanded Medicaid to expand the ability to treat people and have that funded. So that's a really important thing. The other part of the interim is that legislators are at home. So they're closer to you and you can get to them in a much more relaxing setting. When they're in Raleigh, they are being pulled in every different direction. And during the interim, if you're meeting with them, you may get a bit more time with them than you typically would when they're in Raleigh. So the interim is really an important time. So let's get to know the NCG, um, GA website. Uh, this takes my uh, technological skills, so we'll see how I do on this. I have to stop sharing my presentation and then I will um, 
go to the NC General Assembly website, which is ncleg.gov, and I want to show you a few things so you get a little comfortable with it. So let's see if I can do this. I've stopped sharing it, and now I'm going to share screen on the website. Hey, that's pretty good. All right, so this is ncleg.gov. This is the General Assembly website. For me, as a policy wonk, I go here every day when they're in session. Um, they, you can see, <clears throat> let me take a, a sip of coffee. You can see that they have it separated out between the House and the Senate because they meet separately and they do different things every day. When it says joint on a committee, that means that they actually do have both House and Senate members, but the majority of committees are either House committees or Senate committees. And when you look at it, you can see that you can look at their calendar. You see the next day that they're going to convene, which is January 20th at 10 a.m. for the House and January 24th at 3.30 p.m. for the Senate. Um, because as I said, they are still technically in session working on those redistricting issues. You can look at their calendar for the day, which is usually when they're in session, very full. It will tell you, um, this isn't probably going to tell us a whole lot, but typically if it's a really busy day in the legislature, they will give you the bills that they're going to consider that day, the committees that are meeting, and what they might be meeting about. Um, you can also look down here at what they took action on and what bills were filed each day. So, it, so if you miss some days or if you're looking for particular topics, you can find them. A really important part is going to the House and Senate and finding your members. Um, right here is the membership list. You can look at it by county. You can look at each member, and we'll go into that. So I'm from Wake County. I'm going to look at Gail Adcock. She is a um, representative from District 41. She's, uh, as I said, with Wake County. We know that she's a Democrat. That gives you her address, her phone number, her mailing address, how long she has been there um, in the, the um, House of Representatives. It gives you what her occupation is. And I chose her because she is a family nurse practitioner. So we see her name a lot as being actively involved in bills that are pertinent to um, mental health, substance use, intellectual and developmental disabilities. It gives yeah. you that phone number. Yes. Excuse me a second. I'm saying in the um, chat that some people are not being able to see the, uh, screen? The, the, screen, the screen share, but I know I am. I don't know for how many people this may be an issue. But okay, well, it's I looking what I would, like it's not an it. I mean, if it, if if a lot of people can see it, I think what we'll do is you'll see it when you if if you don't mind play it back when you get access to the recording. Okay, y'all, because I'm not we don't really have time to figure out how many people this is an issue for, and how, we may not be able to fix it. It may be something on your end. So anyway, just wanted to right. say that. that okay, uh, thank it looks you. Like, it looks and, like a lot uh, of people can see it, so it's just a I'm, few people, I think. Okay, well, hopefully I'm describing it well enough that you can get some idea of what we're talking about. Um, and so there's the email for the person and then their legislative assistant. That often is the person who answers the phone and does their scheduling. So it, a very important person to get to know if that is a legislator who you want to establish a relationship with. Um, up on the top of that, it also gives the committees that they're in. So she's in the Appropriations Subcommittee of Health and Human Services. She's on the House Health Committee. Those are important things to know when that bill gets referred to a committee. Um, is my legislator on that committee or who is on that committee? So there's a similar list in the Senate that you can go to. Up on the top here, it shows House and Senate. And then you can go to the committees. A House Standing Committee is a committee is just has House members in it, and a Senate Standing Committee only has Senate members in it. Non-standing interim are those joint committees that I was talking about, or they are short-term committees that they have. So you can find out committee members for just about any committee that you're interested in. Um, we can look very quickly at appropriations. Um, 
and it'll give you who the chairs are, uh, the vice chairs, there are a lot of vice chairs, and then the members of it, so that you know who to contact when a bill reaches that committee level. The other thing that I wanted to bring up to you is this search line up here. Um, it says bill. Now you can pull it up by bill number. We can go to S105 um, to the budget bill, 105, and it will um, give you the page that will give you information on that bill. It gives you the actions that were done. Now, SL means Session Law 2021, so in the year 2021, this was a 180th bill to be signed into law. Um, it also gives you every version of that bill. Uh, so it goes from the day that it was filed, what it looked like, to the day that it was signed into law by the governor um, and what it looked like then. The final version is really the one that is most important because that's what becomes law and that's what we follow from and take from there into policy and into what happens in the communities. It also gives you a little bit even more detailed report on the action and you can look at um, the different versions of it. You'll see how it's amended in various places and it gives you that new version um, when it was amended so you can follow the timeline when it was signed into law. Now, if you'd rather what your only search is that you know that you want to pull up a, any and all bills that are about a particular topic, go to bill text. And let's try um, mental health and see what we get. So all of these bills were introduced during this biennium and in them have the words mental health in them. So it narrows it down some for you. It doesn't narrow it down a whole lot. If you really want to narrow it down more, you could say mental health and adults. And that might maybe narrow it down more <laughs> for you. There it does. Um, so you can see what bills, that's an easy way to get to what bills have been introduced that I'm looking for on a particular topic. Mm -hmm. And then you can start going into them as I showed you before. So that is the General Assembly website. It also includes the statutes. So if you're looking up statutes and the ones for mental health are in chapter 122C, um, you can look those up on this website as well. It's just a really informative website. They have improved it significantly over the years. So that's what I wanted to show you on that. I'm gonna stop sharing now and then go back to my presentation. That went much more smoothly than I thought it would, and I'm happy. So there are many ways for you to keep updated on what's going on legislatively. You can go into that website and on the committees, each of the committees has a subscription list that you can get on. It's absolutely free. So you go into that committee as I was showing you and up on the top, it will say, do you want to subscribe to this committee? Um, you can get as many, get on as many committee subscriptions as you want to. What it will tell you is when that committee is going to meet, you'll get a notice of it and you'll get notice if there are any changes about the meeting times or where they're meeting or the access to the live stream or the audio. And I should go back and point that out to you. You do not have to go to Raleigh to be able to see a committee meeting, um, which is a wonderful part of technology and advancing that. Um, because when I started, you had to go to Raleigh to know what was going on in a committee. Now you don't. Um, at first they did just audio, so you can choose that on if they're meeting in a room that has the audio or now because of the pandemic, they have live streams. So you can actually see the speakers and what's going on. You can see the legislators and the, the people that they are calling in to talk about different topics. So again, getting on that committee subscription list will help you keep up with when committees are meeting. Um, there is something similar on the rule side. We'll talk about that in March, but I wanted to mention that from the, the rule side on the Office of Administrative Hearings, you can also get on a free subscription list. 
there is there are opportunities that are, are free. Uh, you just are going to get a few more emails than you're used to getting. Um, and you can learn about them and you'll get into a routine of which ones are important to you or not. There are also go-to resources that you can find out what's going on in the legislature. Um, I really hate that that does that. It moves itself ahead. I guess it gets me moving ahead. <laughs> um, so you can find and kind of have go-to resources that give you updates and information. There might be associations that put them on their website. You don't have to be a member of that association, but you'll get to know what they're tracking or community organizations. Eye to Eye has a newsletter that's free um, that you can get on. And we do uh, legislative up updates when they're in session, um, policy sorts of updates, and then just generally what community organizations are doing and what's going on nationally. Um, and take advantage of free opportunities like webinars and downloads of white papers that can really kind of keep you updated on what the issues are, what they're looking at, and where you have opportunity for advocacy. So when you are talking to a legislator, I know for me that makes me nervous. I don't, I don't know if it does anybody else. And I'm, I, I've been doing this for 40 years. <laughs> And I'll tell you, I still don't have an absolute comfort level. Uh, I just get nervous about it. I want to be articulate. I want to be um, able to convey my point to them. Um, and so the things that I have learned over the time, I, I want to share with you that um, one of the things that you really need to be sure that you know is what your message is. Because as I said, when they're in Raleigh, um, and this is the case in the, at the federal level too. They, you may have blocked out a time with them that is 15 minutes or a half an hour, but I can guarantee you won't get that time with them. You'll go into the office and they're still meeting with somebody else and that cuts into your time. Or they've been called to another meeting, they've been called to the floor, um, a committee is meeting they didn't expect. And so you have this little block of time to get your message through. So be clear in your mind or have it written down what that is, what you want to say to them, what your um, what your story is, but also what your ask is, because they need to know at the end of the day, this person has come to meet with me and I need to take this action after this. So being sure that you are recognizing, I'm sorry, I'm flipping through, um, recognizing that you're probably just going to have a short amount of time with them. That'll be the case if you're talking to them on the phone or if you're doing um, a virtual call with them as well, um, that you may only have a little bit of time. Um, so you just want to plan for that. And then if you have a lot of time, you talk more about why this issue is important um, and what kinds of things can be done to improve North Carolina by passing this. So you create that message, you make it concise, you look, you might use that General Assembly website to figure out who on those committees are people that you want to get in touch with. So who are the key legislators, the chairs of those committees that you want that bill to get in front of, or key policy leaders that need to be aware that that bill is there so that if a legislator asks them about it, they can respond and understand where that bill is coming from. And then you convey your message through those meetings, face-to-face, -face, virtual meetings, through emails to the legislators, to, through phone calls to them. So why is advocacy important now? Why do we have this opportunity? Um, advocacy is always important. At every moment through the year, it's always important. Your perspective is so valuable. And I hope that you know that, but I'm here to tell you that it is. And that learning how to be able to um, advocate and getting comfortable with that will be able to make an impact and change our system. But we have a ton of opportunities that are going on right now that have kind of, I like, I look at it as that they've opened people's minds. They're not necessarily stuck in the historical way that we have done things. So if something hasn't worked in the community, their minds are open right now to hearing about what does work. And some of those kind of drivers of all of these legislative and policy shifts 
are looking at the whole person care. So they're looking at integrated and multidisciplinary, everything that touches an individual to help them feel successful in their services and supports, whole person care. We all have been hearing the term Medicaid transformation. They're changing Medicaid to um, a different type of program. You know, they've separated out the standard plan and will be going into in December of um, this year into tailored plans for behavioral health and IDD services. That is a historical change for us. Um, so we're working with different um, administrators, different payers of Medicaid, but they are going to be focusing on that integrated and multidisciplinary approach. They're gonna be looking at social determinants of health that can impact the, su the success of someone's services and supports and the success for that person. They're going to be looking at racial and health equity issues where there are disparities that we need to address. And they're going to be tracking those, gathering data and addressing those issues. We've never done this before. so they are getting through it they're working it out but that's why this is an opportunity for you because they need to understand from your perspective what is so important about that what do they need to be tracking what do they need to be paying attention to that will have you be successful that's where this opportunity is value-based services is a new concept it's a national trend that we are going through and it is really balancing the quality of services and the cost of services. I like that concept because I feel like there's been a whole lot of leaning into the cost of services. And that's not necessarily getting us to success for everyone. Um, and so looking at how do we balance that? A quality of service can produce a good outcome for that individual that can make them successful. So we go beyond that unit of service and we're looking at that whole person. And that makes it so that every person who is helping, assisting somebody, providing services and supports, has to start having a framework of looking at beyond that unit of service to that continuum for that individual. How do I make it successful for that individual? I have a responsibility to make sure that they have a continuum and that they have um, are able to really look at their whole lives and how this one service is helping them in their whole lives. And then that meaningful data collection and sharing. They are, the state is ramping up their expectations for the standard plans, the tailored plans, and for providers on the data collection that they'll do. But that opportunity is, what do we want them to see in that data? And how does that translate to success for all of us in the community? So there are challenges that are going on. We are really focusing on how do we, um, a, a crisis services. How are people accessing crisis services? Are there crisis services that they can access? How do we preempt that need and help that individual um, get to services, have their own strategies to recognize when they might need those services? And how can we help someone not have to go to an emergency room if that's not the best place for them to receive services? How do we make that public system accessible to all individuals, regardless of their race or where they're located in the state, really focusing on those disparities that, that we have in the state. Um, and how can an individual with lived experience in mental illness who's involved in the justice system get, get connected to the community system? How can they make that transition in a positive way? Those are just some of those challenges that we're working through and you have information that other people don't have. And you have a perspective that is incredibly valuable. So as I said, who knows the best way to overcome these challenges? It's you. Um, and professionals are realizing that they can't be successful in the policy shifts without partnering with consumers and families and individuals with lived experience and mental illness. That's the opportunity. So let me see if I can get this moving again. 
when you don't want it to move, it does move. When you do want it to move, it doesn't move. So let's look at an example of a current bill that is um, in, or a couple bills that are that were introduced in the long session of this biennium that we're in and how you might be able to impact them. The first one is H-786. The title of that bill is to enhance local response slash mental health crises. And it's an act that creates a pilot program um, that gives grants to local communities, local enforcement agencies to enhance their response to mental or behavioral health crises. The current status of that bill is that it was introduced in May of this past year. Um, we have the sponsors of it, which is very important to know because those are the people that initially you might work with to impact the bill. Representatives, it's a House Bill H-786, so representatives Autry, Lambeth, White, and Ball. It has been referred to the Committee on Health in the House. It happens that representatives Lambeth and Representative White are chairs of the Committee on Health. So they have the authority to bring the bill up. And what you do as an advocate, if you are supporting that bill, is support them and give them the reason to bring that bill up. They, they may have it naturally. They may have a personal reason. They may see already the benefit of it, but it will never hurt for you to remind them of that. So a potential strategy is focusing your messaging in this interim on the representatives that sponsored that bill, and particularly on those that are the chairs of the committee that it's in, representatives Lambeth and White, um, thanking them for introducing the bill if you support it, and offering encouragement and um, whatever resources they may need to get that bill going when they get back in session in May because it is active and can be considered in the short session. Additionally, you can also be working on informing and educating other Committee on Health members about the need for that bill. Another bill that's introduced is H-787. So again, it was introduced in the House. The title is Improved Data on Involuntary Commitments, and it establishes involuntary commitment data collection and reporting requirements for area facilities and hospitals where first examinations for involuntary commitments are performed and for LME MCOs. I wanted to say that whole thing because when you're looking at that strategy, it's important to know who's involved in it, who the players are that are really going to have to make this, this bill play out in the community. Um, this bill was also introduced on May 4th, 2021. Uh, there's a similar list of, of representatives, but a little bit different. Representatives Autry, Lambeth, Sasser, and Insco. And this has also been referred to the Committee on Health. What happened was that this bill does not have any funding in it. And so if you recall, I said it has to meet a crossover deadline, which means it would have had to have passed the House without that funding in it and gone over to the Senate by the crossover deadline, which was May 13th, 2021, in order to remain active. It did not make that crossover deadline. So the bill itself is dead, but the concept is not. It's not the end of something because there are other opportunities, even in this legislature, to look at a special provision of the budget um, to look at an amendment to another bill. I have even seen them gut bills that they don't need anymore, just take out all the language and completely repurpose it. So things like that can be done during the legislative sessions. But it's also important to know that sometimes it takes a while to get a legislation or policy enacted. And so you can look at it as we got it started we have this opportunity to get it in front of legislators to educate them. And that next long session, if it hasn't passed, if something hasn't happened, we introduce it, we reintroduce it because we know it's an important issue and it's going to improve the community. So um, as I said on this bill, let's look at it again, the improved data on involuntary commitments, um, data collection and reporting, for air, by area facilities, first examination, and it's performed and for the LME MCOs. 
Um, it's, a, it's a very complicated bill. It's not as simple as that first one of a pilot, including law enforcement agencies. Um, so we want to really be careful about how we're building the message to make it very understandable for legislators. They may not know what an involuntary commitment is. They may have never um, had a family member experience that or know anyone has, who has experienced that. And so they don't un understand uh, what that process is, what it means to people who are going through that process, and why collecting data and understanding it more is so important. So really crafting that very concise message about how this impacts you and then what your ask is, is really important in this legislation. Um, using that opportunity to educate, educate and inform them. And you might want to use the interim right now to encourage Representatives Lambeth and Sasser, because they were sponsors of the bill, um, to take it forward and that you're still interested in this issue. Um, so there are varying levels of strategy, different ways that you can strategize. Another bill, H-788. Um, and if I could ask everybody to go on, on mute so we don't have any kind of background sounds, that would be great. I would appreciate it. H-788. Um, you muted yourself. And you're on mute. Okay, how's that? Okay, H-788, um, Achieve Better Mental Health Recovery Results, uh, focused on supporting peer-run recovery wellness centers by creating a North Carolina mental health recovery and resiliency agenda, and by requiring a mental health recovery policy chief within the division, the state division of mental health, developmental disabilities, and substance abuse services. Um, the status is that it was introduced in May, sponsored by Representatives Autry, Lambeth, Sasser, Brown, referred to the Committee on Health. This is all uh, starting to, to sound familiar, and um, I hope I sort of did that and wanted you to look at these three bills to kind of get a, a sense for how they're processed very similarly, and you can kind of really start learning about the legislative process by seeing how they have to go through these hoops. Um, and again, Representatives Lambeth and Sasser chair the Committee on Health. So it's very similar to that first one. You can fo focus your messaging on the interim to the representatives who are chairs of the Committee on Health who are also sponsors of the bill, Representatives Lambeth and Sasser, and support their efforts, offer yourself as a resource, encourage them to bring that bill up in committee because they have that authority to create the agenda for their committee and push that bill through. And then you can also use this time to inform and educate other Committee on Health members about the bill. So I wanted to, we have just like about three minutes before we're halfway through this presentation. Um, I wanted to bring Lori in, but first just let me tell you that this is my contact information. If you have to leave us after this first hour, feel free to contact me anytime. Um, if you want to get on that newsletter list, you can contact me or um, Jean Overstreet. I should have put that in here, which is Jean at eye to eye center.org, J E A N. Um, we'd love to have you on our, our newsletter and um, conference and information distribution list, and it is free. Um, but Lori, do you want to, I'm going to stop sharing, and do you, is there anything that you want to add about those, those three bills and um, work that you're doing on them? Sure. Just quickly, um, these three bills arose um, out of interest that grew after North Carolina Health News published several articles on our overuse of involuntary commitment in North Carolina. And this all came to their attention because of work done by a working group called the Recovery Alternatives to Forced Treatment Coalition. So we have a work group uh, of PBNC called RAFT um, is the acronym. The folks on the RAFT committee were able to get it information at the state level that showed county by county how many people had been involuntarily committed over a 10 year period. And it was just mind blowing 
uh, except for in, uh, I think, six counties, it didn't really increase that much, but most of the rest of our counties increased tremendously. And the deal is not only as peers, we know how painful and how recovery limiting or it, it, it's so disruptive to have to be involuntarily committed. And then the outcomes of that commitment are often not that good, the, the types of resp treatment responses, et cetera. But for legislators, there's a high price tag to this process of voluntary commitment. It takes a lot of, of funding. And so um, even if they don't care for humane reasons, they would care <laughs> because it's really a costly thing we're doing in North Carolina. So anyway, out of that, um, Shireen um, took the leadership to start meeting with a legislator in her community, Representative John Autry. And um, he had a really uh, energetic, young man that had a lot of expertise in policy to start forming a work group, which eventually uh, resulted in the language for those three bills, 786, 787, and 788. And um, the, uh, the bills, we, we, we got to move forward where we're hoping they would be heard in the health committee. It did not happen in the long session because the uh, legislature right now is so tied up in issues of, um, how do we be sure that the funds coming from the federal government for COVID response are being used well? How do we be sure um, you know, responding to the Medicaid reform? It just, there's just so much going on in the long session. So these bills did not get killed, but they didn't move through the, the session. And those that have finances, any funding attached to them are still subject to going forward in the short session. So we have started reaching out to legislators uh, on that health committee to urge them to hear these issues because as you guys know, the crises are only worse now than they were almost two years ago when PVNC started gathering the data. So um, we are connecting with people who, have, who are the chairs of that health committee. I've written a letter to everybody on the health committee and their staff because often the legislators don't get to important information um, unless their legislative aides have seen the information first and, and make sure, hey, this is, this is something that you probably really wanna read. So I've reached out to both, both those parties, on everybody on that committee. But the cool thing is we have had responses from two of the co-chairs who are talking, share, sharing to me, but talking to each other that they're gonna, they're gonna try to push it through. But, but you, know, you always have a little doubt <laughs> that they're, made, they're including you so that you'll feel good and you'll, and you leave them alone. We can't leave them alone. So anyway, but that's where we are with the one bill I wrote about, which was the one about a mental health recovery agenda and funding for more um, peer center pilots, because we know that peer centers greatly reduce the need for hospitalization. So that's kind of where we are with those. Did you want me to talk more specifically about the other one yet? The, 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 um, um, the No, we'll, we'll talk about that in that second. Path. So that's great. So I think right now we are going to take just a little break for everybody, a bio break as Lori calls yeah. it. Yes. Hey, this is Damie. I just wanted to acknowledge that there are a few folks that have questions. Could you just uh, remind us how we're uh, doing the questions? Well, um, I, I'm okay with us taking a few minutes now if you want to. Um, okay. Um, okay. I see Pat, Pat McGinnis. Pat, you have a question? Yeah. We're talking about their living environments and stuff, and, and I just want to say, you know, I think we're at, in the middle of a perfect storm, but a perfect time, too. I don't know about the rest of the state, but I know for the last two or three days, they have talked on News 13 about the congregate living environments and long-term care facilities and how COVID is exploding again yeah. in these places, and many of our peers are living in these places. So this may be a perfect time for us to get some things done. And I'm just so proud of y'all for doing this and everybody that took time this morning to be on this call. But, uh, you know, we may be, unfortunately, COVID is nobody's advantage. Uh, and it's actually going through my son's family right now. But maybe we can use it to some advantage for our peers. Well Thank said. You. Thank you. Especially since the, each state received great, received great big chunks of funds oh, from the federal cool. government um, with COVID responses. And so we have to be vigilant about what that translates to. Some of it goes directly to counties, but most of it's gone to the state to determine how best to use those funds. 
So right. our voices are needed. Damien, mm -hmm. is there another question? Sure. Um, I see Ren Renata Grossman. Yes. yes, Renata, yes. I have a question about uh, resources and bills and um, avenues that adult Asperger's individuals can be helped with. Because mm -hmm. I'm working with a large group of them and I'm not sure which direction to go. Um, I, I, I am not familiar right off the bat with any bills, but that search that I told you about, um, the bill text, if you get on ncleg.gov, go up to the bill where it says bill and then it has like H, blah, blah, blah. Um, choose on the drop down box, bill text. And I, I, if I were doing this, um, I would first try with Asperger's. I would put that in and see if anything comes up. And if not, then try to come back to a broader topic about that. And it will show you every bill that has any that word in it at okay. all. Then you can okay. kind of see what may have already been introduced that you, um, and then and then go into that bill, read the language to see if you support it or not. Because sometimes you can support the topic, but the way that they're suggesting resolving it isn't viable for you. And yeah. so it's it's important to to read it and not just make the assumption that if it says that it's um, helping this group, it probably is a good bill. Sometimes it's not. You and you know because you're in the community and know how it how it plays out. Okay, great. Thank you very much. And Renata, I put my email address in the chat if you want to write me I, I i have a son an adult with asperger's and so i've been down that whole path but we have a lot of folks with processing differences that come to our peer center and often the depression and anxiety are really secondary to the processing issues but our 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 mental health system doesn't know how to respond to that so i'm, I'm really really interested in this issue too and i also think that this is where people who value recovery um, should get behind occupational therapy for folks yeah. who have processing differences. And we now have two programs in our state, graduate programs, training people in mental health type uh, occupational therapy. And we've got people coming to the peer center from our, our local OT program um, because I saw how much it's the processing issues that are holding people back and, they, and yeah. they're anxious about it. No, so anyway. Yeah. Well, it's it can be frustrating over time because you don't know you're confusing people because they don't ask questions. Yeah. And so Amen. I'm telling yeah. people all the time, this is the way I understood it. If you don't understand it, please ask me questions so that I can explain it because I can't figure out how uh, neurotypicals think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I appreciate that, Lori. I'll be in touch with you. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think Joyce has had her hand up for a while. And I don't know if, Joy oh, yeah. <laughs> so my question is, because uh, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of vaguely new um, with, um, I'm, I'm doing, I've done peer support training and, and I'm actually um, more on the recovery side of addictions and mental health, we know goes with that. It's hand in hand. Mm -hmm. And so um, I guess my question to being legally blind I have like several areas of advocacy. So. Yes, you do. <laughs> um, and I guess when uh, you were saying about the nonprofit and being careful about the guidelines, because I actually now I'm, I'm like in the midst of don't know what to do. I've, I'm, so I are you a, with a, a, a nonprofit? I actually own a nonprofit. I have started oh, no. a nonprofit. Okay, um, I would suggest that I, I also have a nonprofit, I also lead a nonprofit. Um, and so we have to, in order to maintain our nonprofit status, we cannot be what they're calling lobbying. Um, the, you, I think it's maybe, uh, I, I'll say, I don't wanna say a percentage because I'm probably wrong about that, but there's a percentage of your time that you can lobby without um, losing your nonprofit status. There are tons of resources um, on the web, on the internet that you could Google um, about nonprofit lobbying. Advocacy is, is different. And remember that is around system change, much more than just necessarily one bill. 
Um, and that's kind of the, the 50,000 foot level difference between the two. Um, but I, I would suggest that you use the internet to kind of understand like where lobbying comes in. Um, and obviously that is doing like one-on-one -on -one with a legislator, working with them on a particular bill, um, really taking the lead on pushing that through. That might be considered lobbying. So um, I would suggest that you look at resources online for that. Um, but it is something you have to pay attention to when you have a nonprofit. Um, let's see. So we want to be sure we can take a break. I see two other hands up. Um, I, Damie, I wasn't tracking who was first. Yeah, they came right in order. So Angela and Stephanie are the last two questions. Okay. So Angela, good morning. I don't see that you're on mute, but we're not hearing you. Um, okay. Now okay. we hear you. Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. So um, I quit my PAC treasurer corporate position in 2016 to take care of my full-time disabled children who are now adults. And now I'm an EOR, which is an employer of record through my local MCO. Oh, so okay. I wanted to make sure um, if I'm in the right training or if I need to be in the other training because of that past history. Um, um, it's really about, as far as I understand it, your status now, uh, where you are now if you would get into uh, the lobbying kind of realm. Um, I think Lori, this sounds a little bit like something that might be a future training, um, mm -hmm. getting understanding the difference between advocacy and lobbying and when lobbying, when yeah. you cross that line over to lobbying. Um, but, it, but it really is about what you're doing right now for the status. If you've been involved with an organization in the past, but you're no longer affiliated with them, you're not going to impact that, that organization by um, talking to legislators. Yeah, so currently I am not with any nonprofit at all. So I think I'm registered as a treasurer for a sheriff that's running um, for Wake County, but I have that's only because I know how to use, input donors into the system. But I, I can remove myself if that, I mean. I, I'm pretty sure you don't have to, um, but I, I think that you can feel free to advocate. Um, and not worry about that. So uh, yeah, I just want to ask you and Lori is I this is my my you know my heart. So I just want to make sure I'm in the correct training. Well, yes. first of all, yeah, Sue, and I wanted to add. Sorry, I'm, I'm trying to hear. Are, are you a person with your own personal lived experience of kind of disruption with because of mental health challenge and you've gotten better again? So yeah, that's it exactly. Okay, okay. Yeah. that part I wouldn't. Okay. Um, I think there are a lot of different work roles that many of us may have that are with human services organizations, but our own individual personal advocacy, usually it, it, it's, it's apples and oranges. If and if, unless, if you are in a position in your organization where you are giving input into that organization's policy, like if you're kind of like a, at a leadership level, you might want to get it cleared with um, your, you know, the, the leadership of your organization that you want to do advocacy on in your personal time and be sure that they are supportive of that. We have somebody on our board at, uh, for my nonprofit for Green Tree um, yeah, who happens to work for an MCO, but she her value is coming from a position and a lot of passion as a person with lived experience. So she went to her her uh, boss to be sure that they understood what she was doing, why she was doing it, so there'd be no conflict of interest. And she's not on their board, and she's not in a position where she helps to shape policy so that there's no conflict of interest. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm not on, I'm not on in an MCO or, or any kind of nonprofit. Uh, employer record is self-directed. Yeah. So I actually just okay. work for myself. Yeah, it sounds like you're probably okay. Yeah, I think so. Um, okay, Stephanie. Thanks. 
Hey everybody, Stephanie Almeida with Smoky Mountain Harm Reduction. I'll remove my mask, but I have an intern here. I gotta keep my face covered. Um, my point is well past when you were talking about the occupational work. I just wanted to remind folks that um, we've got a lot of folks with anoxic and hypoxic brain injuries that are gonna need occupational therapy. And none of us are really screening in any sort of uh, way really for uh, brain injuries relating to overdose. So um, yeah, just something to remember around the occupational work that we Thank really you. need to make space for those. Thank you. Thank you. That's excellent. I, that's an example of advocating right there. Thank yeah. you, Stephanie. Okay, so it is now 1115. We had planned to take the break at right at 11. Should we just continue on? Um, Lori and Damien, uh, Karen, I'm kind of asking you and Shar or should we uh, take that little break? If you have the time to take a three to five minute break and get back to what you need to do, Ann, I think we should do that. But we okay. should tell people whether it's gonna be three or five minutes and tell them what time we're starting. And those who aren't back then, it's it's just, they're gonna be their loss, but but you know, we just need to be prompt about starting back, so. Um, okay, um, uh, how, how about that three minute break at 11.18, we'll start back. Sounds good. Everybody run to okay. the potty, run to the potty. Yeah. <laughs> I'm back. Should we go ahead and get going so that hopefully we can yes. wrap up right at noon as planned? I have 1118. So. All right. Well, so this is a um, new presentation. And I just want to mention the reason that we did that is because we are recording this. We're planning to put it um, on, I think, YouTube where it's accessible to you all. And so, you know, a lot of times you're not going to have a meeting that's two hours long or have that kind of time. So if people want to look at it in two different segments, they'll be able to do that. Um, so just mentioning that. The second half, what we're focusing on is advocacy through collaboration. Okay. So get my slideshow started. 
And again, I'm Ann Rodriguez. I'm the executive director of the Ida Eye Center for Integrative Health. I put in the slide about being a policy wonk, but um, I'm really here to just offer you my experience so that you can take that further and um, be a strong advocate, have that comfort level in doing your advocacy work. Uh, I really liked this quote from Helen Keller. Alone, we can do so little. Together, we can do so much because that's why we're talking about collaboration. Because when you're working with other individuals and, and other groups, you really can expand on your reach and what you can do. So we're going to talk about that a little in this last bit of time that we have. We're going to look at definitions first real quick. Collaboration is to work jointly with others and or together, especially in an intellectual endeavor. Uh, that certainly fits the bill when it's legislation. No pun intended on the fits the bill, but um, it does uh, for legislation and for policy. Uh, it, those are intellectual endeavors that really play out to be real things for all of us. I wanna mention the word coalition because I'm gonna be bringing that up as well. A body formed by the coalescing of originally distinct elements. So you may have your point of view and working with another group that has an entirely different focus may actually work for you because the legislation crosses over both areas or the policy crosses over both areas. So you might look at doing building a coalition. And then there's a new word that I, I just really like, so I throw it out there all the time. It's called coopetition. Um, and I think it's important for us to understand that not as providers, but if you are a provider, that part of what you may need to do, even if you're in competition with another provider, is work with them, collaborate with them on legislation or on policy, because it will help you both in the way that you're able to do your your business. And you may may how can think of other examples of coopetition. So let's talk about advocacy by building those community collaborations and coalitions. There are a lot of advantages to doing that. Um, as I said, it, you've got a, a further reach, you pull your resources together. So even if you're just an individual, um, who doesn't have, you know, any money to do it, any kind of work with a legislator or anything like that, that's okay. And definitely it helps to pull resources so that you're collaborating. You may not have a printer to copy off um, things that you want to give to legislators, but another group may have it. It may be as simple as that. Um, but there are lots of, of different levels of pooling your resources. And then of course, broadening your network. So everybody you know, and everybody that other group knows or that other individual knows, brings it together where you really have expanded your reach to people. Um, sometimes, most times, it takes a lot of work to get an idea that you know is going to improve the system, take it through legislation or policy. It takes a lot of time um, and a lot of effort. It may take other resources like those education materials. And so you're sharing in that legwork and sometimes you're sharing in creativity. Like I, I'm not a technologically advanced person. Um, so I love to work with people who are because they can help me in my materials look to look good um, where I don't have that skill set. You can share in your strategies and your experiences and your, your connections, again, building out your reach. And then you develop those relationships by collaborating that in the future, when another issue comes up, you already have that established. You have that relationship established so that you know that you all can partner well and that you can work together. So you may have a piece of legislation that you're working on together that gets passed. You're successful. Um, you go back to your work. Another way that you can improve the system comes up that you want to work with this group again, and you already have this relationship. So you're not starting over creating that dynamic. And you're also showing to other groups that you have that capacity to partner. So they are more likely to want to partner with you. And it you're raising up the exposure of yourself as an advocate or of your organization as an advocacy organization. So you increase that respect and awareness of what you're doing, what you're working toward, and what your message is. 
But being a part of a collaborative or a coalition really does take some, as I said, legwork. It takes some pre-work. You have to really think through what is the appropriate membership for this collaborative or coalition? What perspectives do we want to have at the table? Um, is there a pers perspective that is strategically important and hasn't been included in the past? And I would say that um, a lot of times for individuals with lived experience in mental illness, you can say that maybe your perspective wasn't included in the past at the points in time when it really could have been meaningful. Um, so you really have to think through what perspectives need to be at that table and also advocating for having the right perspectives if it's not, if you haven't created that table. Um, take time to understand the issue and understand the perspectives. Uh, because we're going to get a little further into it where you may be talking and working with people who have a business perspective about this. It doesn't mean you can't work with them. You have to understand that perspective and they need to respectfully understand your perspective. But take the time to understand the issue so that when you do go into meetings, it's not, um, it's not necessarily kind of overrun by one perspective that you you are able to speak to that issue as well and uh, we talked about all the resources that are available going to different um, association websites and looking up what they're writing about a particular issue or news stories about it um, or other organizations community-based organizations so that you're sort of educating yourself on where they might be coming from and what their concerns are about that and then um, I always want to put this out here, consider options. I, I'll, I'll say it to you, although I feel I'm singing to the choir, but I say it to every group, consider options for compensating individuals who are important perspectives, but they're not being paid to be there at that, that table. Others, you know, professionals are coming in and they're getting paid so they can be there from nine to 10 in the morning on a Tuesday um, when you may have a job that uh, is, does not involve this and does not encourage you to go to these types of meetings. And so looking at compensation that would make it worth your while because of the important perspective that you hold. Um, always being kind of looking at ways that you can become a go-to resource, a go-to resource for le legislators, a go-to resource for other community organizations, for policy leaders, and that may be um, making sure that they they know how you understand this issue, what your concerns are, um, educational tools. And then creating that atmosphere when you do pull together that collaborative, creating that, expe that expectation that thinking outside the box is okay, that it doesn't have to be about the way historically things have been done. I, I have been to a lot of meetings where the concern will come up, but that's that's not the way that we've built it. That's not the way that we've done it before. But for a, a collaboration, and especially in the beginning of it, you want to think outside the box. Eventually, you, you have to consider those historical things because they may become challenges or barriers for you that you have to take into consideration. But you get to take care of, take them into consideration in an innovative way. We have this idea over here that we know is viable. It's going to improve the system. We have these challenges here of the way that the system currently is. So thinking outside the box um, and creating that atmosphere in your collaborations that people can do that, that's how we get to innovation. I think you all know that. But um, sometimes I think that we can get into um, creating an environment where it's not, it's not necessarily valued and we want to be sure that we are valuing that. And then periodically checking in with participants because when somebody is taking the time to be a part of a collaborative, they're taking the time because they think that you, you are going to help them get to their goal. And it's important to check in periodically to make sure that they still think that that if you need to kind of rework or redirect your conversations to make it more useful to everybody who is there and taking the time to be a part of that, 
I think that's worth, it's beneficial and worth your time. You don't want people dropping out along the way and then leaving you again to do this yourself and, and leaving you without their resources. So it's important to do that periodic check-in. Um, when you're collaborating, and I've talked about this throughout this morning, about um, you have to be very clear about what it is that you ultimately want to achieve. And that really might mean prioritizing what's important to you. Um, it, when you're in a collaboration or a coalition, oftentimes it means you're not going to get 100% of what you want. So knowing what the most important thing is that you need to achieve and making sure everybody else knows what is most important to you to achieve really helps along that collaborative experience. And it really helps it to be successful. And if you are a part of an organization, it really does, if you're there and you're representing that organization, it means that you have to have a way to reach back to the organization, touch base with them, say, this is where we're headed with this collaboration. Does it still make sense for us? Is there something I need to take back to them? So have that process in place where you are able to vet the um, issues that come up say that collaborative decided to go to do a particular action or create a particular product you need to have a communication line already set up with your organization to be able to go back maybe it's a contact person or a committee that you get in touch with and you say does this still work for us what what points do i need to raise in this discussion and be able to do that pretty quickly, actually, to bring it back to the, co the collaborative or the coalition that you're a part of. Um, and also making sure that whatever leadership is a part of your organization is supporting everything that you're doing, because it, it's the worst feeling to get to a table. You think that you're collaborating for a group and um, you don't know where they're exactly what they would want to do when things become more specific. And then you don't have that backup of leadership. I hope that has never happened to people, but I have seen it happen and I don't want it to happen to people. So making sure that you have that leadership support for where you're headed. And that goes back to why it's so important to have that, um, that vetting process in place. And it does require your commitment to ongoing participation, to make sure that your voice, your position is heard and it's incorporated. Things can change drastically in just one meeting of a collaborative or a coalition. Um, if you can't be there, maybe you wanna identify somebody else who can be there on your behalf or talk to somebody who's on that collaborative who you know shares a very similar perspective and say, I can't be there. These are the things that are important to me. Making sure you're getting the notes and you're staying active in, in it even if you can't be there, but really have that ongoing participation. And as I said, making sure, evaluating that your collaborative is staying on track to meet the goals that you want to meet, that you haven't gone off to something that what I call a rabbit hole, where um, you really are going to, it, it's kind of going off, veering off of what your goal is. It's a sideline that isn't going to really keep you on track. So that periodic evaluation of it. So I've always got to have my slide, why is this important now? And it's always about opportunity. I use that word so much because um, as we talked about when we, when, when we had the questions, and I think Pat said it so well too, that there is a lot of opportunity right now, even if it's topics that are very heavy, like the pandemic, there are opportunities within that for us to strengthen and change the system. And it's important for us to kind of figure out a way to really recognize and um, bring individuals with lived experience and mental illness right in at the beginning. Um, and that peer voice is getting stronger. I hope you know that th that's true. I'm seeing that nationally and at the state level. You have people like Lori and Shireen and others who are really pushing, pushing the line on that and being successful in it. And so 
they're going to continue on with their policy discussions at the state level and at the legislature. We, they're always going to be considering cost of things. But one thing that you can do is translate that into how that's important to you and what's meaningful to you from your perspective, um, as well as conveying your story about that. I'll always say you hold a valuable, maybe the most valuable perspective in these discussions. But I've certainly experienced that oftentimes you get there and the majority of the discussion is around that business perspective, the cost of it, uh, where the money is going to come from, how people can get reimbursed for their services, all of those things. And they're important discussions. They, they can't go away. They're not going to go away. But how do we be a part of those discussions, but translate them into the perspective of a consumer or a family member and, um, and peers? How do we do that? And um, I put down this, this tip that when you can translate it, and by translating, I mean that you can collaborate with an organization that is focused on that business perspective. When you can collaborate with them, it does expand your voice. You're helping them to understand what your goal and need is in order for you to be successful and therefore for them to be successful. So it, it can be done and it is really important. So let's go back again to legislation to create an example of collaboration. And Lori's going to help me with this when we get into the real specific example of it. We're going to use that bill H-786 to enhance local response mental health crises that we talked about. Um, the pilot program offering grants to local law enforcement agencies to really enhance the re their ability to respond to mental health or behavioral health crises. I've put the current status in there just to remind you of where we're at on that. So how do we take that bill and translate it into policy priorities that are important to individuals with lived experience in mental illness? Um, we mentioned, I talked before, about some of those policy priorities that they have in the state. They're focusing on crisis services, the availability of it, the appropriateness of it, of preempting crisis services and creating a stronger community-based system um, for people. They're not anywhere near, we are not anywhere near where we need to be as a system. I, I'm pretty sure all of us would, would agree on that. Uh, but that's a policy priority, so that's an opportunity. Partnering with key community players, um, law enforcement that is one that comes up in this particular bill, on assisting them and supporting them to know how to identify individuals with mental health needs and how they can help them and try to divert away from a crisis, divert away from emergency rooms, inappropriate um, places for, for service and the best thing that's for that individual. And also about reducing racial disparities. So those are some of those priorities that are coming up, not just in states, but nationally, that you can use as a basis for translating something that has been introduced and is being considered mostly from a business perspective into the perspective that you have and being able to help people understand that. Um, and then you identify what policy shifts that aligns with or what policy that's in place. So Medicaid transformation is focusing on social determinants and racial and health equity. And that by doing that, by the way that they have structured it into this managed care sort of system, it's all about the risk that payers and providers hold. And what you wanna do through this pilot is decrease their risk it can help decrease their risk by finding ways to assist people in the community when they're at crisis level that's not at that high cost or inappropriateness of emergency rooms. Helping people, particularly like law enforcement agencies, to understand and be able to have the skills to work, work with and help somebody and their family when they're in crisis. Um, so we have Medicaid transformation and that concept about risk. And then what Medicaid transformation has also done is driven us toward wanting to have much more meaningful data that we actually use, not that we just collect, 
but that we use to inform us and help us improve the system. And then the pilot is an opportunity to give it a try, work out kinks, and figure out how we can replicate that statewide. So let's look at that translation. How do you define success in this pilot for individuals with lived experience and mental illness? Figuring out what is your top goal in doing that pilot. And I think that um, Lori can talk to this a little bit further in um, after I finish this, more specifically about what they're doing. And then we'll talk about um, possible strategies on, on this particular bill. So what is your top goal? What is the bottom line that you want to accomplish with this? You, not necessarily uh, Representative Lambeth or um, the law enforcement agencies, but what do you want to accomplish with this? And how do you articulate that message clearly and concisely? So before you can go and get partnerships, you really have to have that piece. You have to know what your bottom line is because there's probably going to be some negotiation, some compromise, some working. You've got to identify that bottom line. And you don't want to immediately go into a partnership when you haven't figured that out because that's when those business perspectives rise to the top because they're doing this every day and they know what they want. And it's, I'm not um, diminishing that. The, that. That is very, very important to success. But the perspective of what's successful for individuals with lived experience and mental illness, that's just as important. And we need to know what that goal is and that bottom line is for this initiative. What other perspectives can you bring into? You can speak to them, you can partner with them. The, that pilot includes law enforcement agencies. It will include the LME MCOs. Because it's crisis services, it will include the standard plans and it could include hospitals. Those are just some of the um, ideas that I have, but you may have even more ideas about people to partner with this on this. And then thinking about what their perspective is. And you can find that out by simply asking them too. Um, and again, having that message about what is most important to you. And then figuring out where your message aligns with their message and what their their, how your goal aligns with their goal and collaborating on that to expand your voice. Um, when prior to becoming eye to eye, we were the statewide association um, actually for the LME MCOs. That's been a few years now, um, but it was always important for us to understand um, at, at the association level what the other perspectives were because it was very difficult to just come in just from one perspective and convince a legislator that that was worth going through. If you can bring in other perspectives, they start noticing that issue and say, oh my gosh, we can take care of an issue that's important to people with lived experience. We can take um, care of an issue that's going to help law enforcement agencies and is going to help the system. So really expanding your voice by aligning your, your perspectives. Um, you don't have to have the same exact message when you're going because you have what was most important to you, but you can complement each other and use that we're working with this organization to kind of raise the awareness of what you're doing. I went backwards tonight, or wait a minute, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, so create a long-term strategic plan for action that includes both legislative and policy actions. I wanted to say this because if there isn't anything I have learned in my, I don't want to tell you how many decades I've been doing this, it's that it takes time and it's not a one one shot deal you may have an issue that you know is important and, and maybe it is around um, collecting, inform, um, collecting data on involuntary commitments. And that may take a couple times introducing it in the legislature. It may look at policy actions that you can take in the interim. Um, it, it's not a linear process. You may be going forward and then taking a few steps back and continuing to go forward. Anne, you're on mute. Anne, you're on mute. 
Okay, I don't know how long I've been on, on mute. So I'll just um, recap that. Have that long-term plan of action and um, understand and don't get frustrated with the process if it doesn't happen quickly, because oftentimes it doesn't. I read something back when I first started that it takes about two years to change policy. Um, that's on average. And I have not been involved with policy that goes in place in in two years a whole lot it's it's very fulfilling when that happens and it can but it doesn't often happen like that so give yourself time and have a long-term strategic plan connect with the law enforcement associations as as i mentioned we're talking about this particular bill um, the lmemcos the standard plans in your area or any other interested stakeholders where you can inform them about the bill and if you're really um if you can find their perspective and convince them that they should put some momentum into the bill themselves put some energy into the bill to help you get that passed get it up to the committee level get it heard by legislators and get it into um, the discussions at the state level for policy all of those things help by collaborating and having partners and um I, I think that we just experienced talking um, about several of the people who asked questions were talking about what's most important to them. They use that opportunity to kind of raise that, that part of what we're looking at in advocacy up. Um, I think that was a great example of how you grab opportunities to talk about initiatives that you have, um, using them when you are in um, other venues, when you're in meetings, talking to them to kind of build up that energy and that momentum for legislation or for policy to be changed. And then in this particular instance, because it's a pilot, you would want to get ahead of it and look at communities where the pilot might be most viable. Um, are you looking for areas where there are health disparities or where um, there are racial inequities? Do you want to focus on that? And what are those areas that you can really improve that or get some data that really helps you to replicate this pilot? Um, or are there areas where there's really strong and open-minded law enforcement agencies that would want to work with you on this. There's just different ways that you can look at that um, that will help you to kind of expand your reach. So right now, what I wanna do then, because we have 14 minutes, is just point out this, this screen. What I've done is pulled up a few resources. They are all links for you on collaboration. If you wanna get started on that, there's tons of stuff on the internet, but these are some things that I have used and I find to be very helpful to me as resources. And I wanted you to have those. But let's go back and if I can bring Lori into it, we'll talk a little bit more about ways, let me go back to the uh, initial bill that we're talking about. Um, to enhance that local response mental health crises, create that pilot program. Um, so Lori, do you want to talk a little bit more about this bill and where you're at with it? Laura, you're on mute. You're on mute, Lori. Poor Karen's going to have a hoarse voice from reminding us to put ourselves back. <laughs> and, and sometimes I didn't even know how I got on mute. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. That happened long ago. I think it, <laughs> we didn't miss much at all what you said before Karen said. Anyway, um, what I wanted to say is, first of all, where we are with that bill, it has not been, it's not been as much the focus of immediate activity on my part yet, but um, I'll tell you kind of how I feel like we've gone about developing some partnerships about this. And this is a place where um, I know that Promise Resource Network and the way it's been positioned in Mecklenburg County, which is known to have a lot stronger partnerships probably than most of our counties, uh, she can address a lot of these same issues and pr probably far better than I can. But I will say that um, the way the bill is written it is, we would like it to see it optimized 
um, and that we'd like to see more emphasis and more funding go to non-police or co-responder models and, and less on the CIT focus because of some research, research about CIT. But, um, and then there was another language change that some of the folks would like to have seen. So I'm just saying in case you see it more, if, if it does go forward into the short session, um, the bill is aimed at funding the local law enforcement agencies in a way that if you have a community with aren't very strong collaborations, that could be an issue. So we may try to see folks get involved in advocating for a language change to where it's the funding goes to some kind of a partnership or maybe to the county with a requirement that the county is or the city is partnering with other agencies. But um, putting that aside, um, the what I wanted to kind of share is is some of what. Well, I guess I closed it after all, but I, no, here it is. Um, what, what's happened with us, and I know Peer Voice and a couple of other peer operated organizations is we have been at a level where we have really seen crises, people in crisis up close and personal. And the interesting thing about a crisis is that a crisis presents an opportunity in an individual's life. Doesn't matter whether you have a diagnostic label or not, that's just a human thing. A crisis can be an opportunity for something to really improve in one's life. But how we are responded to when we are in crisis can make all the difference and set us on a really good path or a not so good path. And so we need to consider that a crisis, in a mental health crisis in a community is actually an access issue. How do people access the supports and, and things they need? This is important because we have a new committee in the legislature now on access and Medicaid reform. So the crisis, uh, one, of the, one of our legislators wrote to me that it's possible that this may be looked at too from that perspective of access. But what we're seeing is peer agencies have a unique way of engaging folks in crisis. And through uh, PRNs, um, respite model and then something we're do, doing here, um, we're saying that we can receive folks in crisis and help them um, kind of get their feet under their knees <laughs> emotionally, help them get a little bit regrounded and then help link them in a more meaningful way to the context and the things they need. And through that process, uh, Green Tree has formed a lot of working relational partnerships with folks in the last year, especially that are going to be really helpful if this bill starts getting traction. And so we have uh, uh, strong representatives from our sheriff's department and our police department who really value what's happening at Green Tree. Um, we, our city council has a public safety committee that could also be a focus of inreach. Um, and our local public health agency has some strong folks that are collaborating with us who are more engaged about around the opioid and addiction issues. But these are all, you know, um, they're all, you can't separate addiction and mental health challenges when it comes to crises because it all kind of arises from, you know, trauma and just points of tremendous stress. And so, I work real strongly with our local um, opioid task force um, that's, that's run by our public, uh, an, a, a gal in our public mental health agency, I mean, our public health agency. Um, we also in our community have happened to have a, a really reputable mental health EMS team. And so they are also kind of a partner with us on issues. So they, it, my point is, before I think about the legislative issue, I'm thinking, how do I make all this relatable to my legislator? So Representative Donnie Lambeth happens to live in Winston-Salem. And what I've learned about him is that if I'm building consensus among local partners and we start conveying the same interests and concerns to him, then uh, we can have a real impact at that point with, with him realizing this is not just one voice, this is a voice of many people who have a shared experience in, in my community. And, and so um, that's why the partnership piece, I'm so excited that Ann, you know, she really felt like this should be 
part of this presentation, but if we have collaborators that value the peer's role, the peer's voice, our experience, not just our own personal experience with ill-being, but our experience with finding wellness and learning how to contribute again. What we've learned along that path is so important to building partnerships and, and getting really clear and passionate meaning to our legislators. So uh, that, that's just kind of what I have to share because I wanted to say my county is probably a lot more like a, probably the majority of North Carolina counties where it's been a challenge to build partnerships. And in my community, what's happening right now is because, partly because I'm old, experienced, and desperate for change, I'm learning how to reach out meaningfully to the people that don't seem to come together as easily usually. And, and I think there's a level of trust because I just never have gone away, you know, and they kind of know who I am. I'm consistent, but um, we are uniquely posed as peer organizations and as peer voices coming together in our local communities to try to reach into other organizations and form that partnership that then will go uphill and inform our legislators. Right. And it could be all going on at one time. And so that's kind of what, what I, that's the strategy I'm taking on this issue. So that eventually we can say to Re Representative Lambeth, here's what we think would really, really work in our community with regard to this bill. So. That's great. Thank you. That That's wonderful. Um, Wendy, you have had your hand up for a while. So you have a question or a comment? And you just need to take yourself off mute. Okay. First question was when she was talking about this portal. Are you talking about, it, are you talking about a portal program that you're trying to launch and how long is the portal am i am i having the right understanding of because i'm uh and also another question was how many of this peer board or whatever this that you're affiliated with how many of the people are consumers is it half and half consumers or families that are experienced with mental health or like i'm not quite sure i was invited to this by the north carolina brain injury so i'm trying to understand is this a is this a consumer base 100 percent or just some or yes that's a great question peer voice north carolina uh, is a uh it's a movement it's a working movement that people are kind of coming into as they find out uh, about of people with lived experience how many is the ratio of consumers because it's a hundred percent uh there may uh, some people may be consumers and family members, right. but we, the, the bottom line is, have you personally experienced these things? Oh, all, what, all of but and I actually am, have been invited to be on three different boards, and I have just recently got approved for the North Carolina brain injury, and on that one day of class, uh, Olmstead invited me, uh, Alliance invited me, and so it was NMC that sent me yours. And what I'm finding from doing these classes is, is that they're saying it's consumer based, and I get the concept. And you got these people that come, and what happens is, is a lot of times the people that are delivering the message, like you and this young lady right here, is it's very like I'm so seasoned in services that I know some of the terms you're using. Like I know I just learned what a portal program was through the TBI, LME. What happens is it's a communication barrier, and and I don't mean to offend anybody. And and a lot of times us people with see a lot of people that are leading it are seasoned, educated consumers that have affected themselves. So this language that y'all are talking like this portal and we're going to do this and doing that, I can't speak for anybody else and I'm well seasoned and I work with the best of the best. My 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 therapist is the director of compliance of a very big entity and then I'm in the TBI program and I know Doug Wright from Alliance in North. I mean I'm very linked and I've really put the work in and I read service definitions and it even trips down into the services. People are having this expectation and because us, if we're fresh out of these are still entertaining these disorders and we're not educated and we don't know the language, all this stuff you said, a lot of it I get, but if someone was just coming to the table as a family member, we don't know what in the world you're talking about. I don't nobody know what the portal is and the LME and you're really politicking with us, the politicking you do with the senators and we're not on that page, I'm not. So okay, for, yeah. Wendy, I appreciate what you're saying. I hear yeah. what you're saying very clearly. Um, I, 
I will tell you, I don't know that I used the word portal or if anybody did, so I apologize. It's several I'm, times that it was a portal or a port program that you were trying to get launched, and you, I, I didn't like I got a program. I am because I was just wanted to be clear on what you were communicating to us that you're trying to get launched. Like we can't advocate for something we don't okay. understand. Okay, I, I think that's a great point. I really appreciate that, and I think and I, I missed the mark on this um, presentation with that. I have borderline personality disorder, TBI, communication issues. So I'm sorry I didn't do it professional, but I'm really saying this from a place of goodness because what you're yes. doing is amazing. But yes. we got to understand. We, and there were too shame. For years, I was too shamed to even say, what's portal mean? What's collaborate mean? I didn't even know what collaborate meant until 20, 10 years ago when I'm 54 because I don't know. I don't know what you're saying. So that right. what happens. Listen, we listen and listen and you ain't got no hands coming up because one, you know, and you, that took a minute to get answered to ask because I was trying to find out so I could understand what you needed help with because I might okay. could help you. I've got quite a voice. Okay. Thank you, Wendy. So, yeah, she was talking about a pilot program. Um, and just for you all to know, pilot means that they're going to test it out somewhere. Right. They're going to put it in place in a limited area and see how it works, try to work out issues that they found before they build it out and put it in other places in the state. So um, we are in this bill talking about a, a pilot program, but I really appreciate what you're saying. I think you're exactly right. And I um, I think I, yeah, I sort of forgot that and I appreciate you reminding me. Um, I wanna offer, Lori, that we, I did a um, like a glossary of terms. I don't even know if that could help help people, but I'd be happy to share it with you for you to share with the group. Um, and it goes to, you know, LMEMCO for you to know that means local management entity slash yeah. managed care organization. It's a long title. Um, those kinds of things. If that would be helpful to people, I'd be happy to to share it. Um, and I'm going to be more aware when I do my presentation in March about explaining those terms. So thank you so much for pointing that out. Um, it is 12.01 and we, and we want to be respectful of everybody's time. So, Lori, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, so we were answering that. All right. Yeah. We, thank you, Ann, for the clarification because I was a little bit lost there. But I do hear her message that sometimes some of us are speaking at a level where, where other people haven't gotten to. And um, that is going to be, a, we're going to constantly be dealing with that because what we're trying to do is balance the urgency of now against bringing folks along and both are so important. So thanks Wendy for bringing that up and yes. we will share that, that um, document that Anne's going to share with us. And again, in February, part of our half of the meeting in February will be about messaging and language that can be more effective. And so it's, uh, not just language is effective for talking with a legislator, but what kind of language can we start sharing? So we have kind of a shared pool of meaning. We're building consensus around certain ideas and themes so we can all be advocating together. And so that's what February is gonna be about. So anyway, um, well, did I have, was there anything else I needed to say with, <laughs> as far as that, that issue? I think you covered it. Um, is there a way for people to get the um, handouts and like the glossary I was talking about? Yes, um, and we're going to keep up. Uh, it, it, uh, when people uh, regis register for, to participate in the Zoom, we have their registration information. And when we can get that together in a listserv, Peer Voice North Carolina will send that out with all the requested information. Beautiful, okay. Uh, somebody asked if there are CEUs. I do not believe that there are CEUs for this session. That's Am I right correct. about that, Lori? Okay. That's correct. We tried to clarify that on Facebook. Um, we just, we are a volunteer uh, organization, a volunteer network. I won't, I won't even say organization. We are a volunteer network and um, most of the folks who've really jumped in and tried to get peer voice going are folks who've already also started engaging a lot of different ways in their local communities and were pretty stretched and we just didn't have an efficient way yet of figuring out how to do CEUs. But also our hope is that whoever has come has come from a, a perspective of passion for change and 
that well, they'll still find this time valuable even without CEUs. So, I, well, I go ahead, Ann. I think I think are we ready to sign off for this? Well, I wanted. I wondered, uh, Damie. I meant to text you, Damie. Do you want to? Do you do you want to take time or not to share just a little bit about what you're doing for the Black leadership? Yeah, sure. Real quick, let me come off video. Okay, so as um, I put some information in the chat. Um, today, just uh, letting folks know a little bit more about PBNC, but also, you know, that we're driven by several coalitions. One of them is Peer Advocacy, which took the lead today. That was Lori and organizing this training, but a new emerging um, coalition that's come out of um, a lot of the things that Anne had mentioned around what some policy changes and need for addressing um, behavioral health and racial disparities in health systems has been around um, the Black Leaders Coalition. And that is a new um, group that I'm trying to organize. And if folks are interested in um, being part of those conversations, um, if you're a Black African-American or um, uh, identify as a person from the African diaspora, um, you're welcome to those calls. Um, and we also had several people who do not identify as African-American who want to be part of the conversation in terms of just having conversations around his peers and being best allies when we're doing this advocacy work. So um, I'll put the email address for me in the chat. I'll, you'll probably see it as infopbnc at gmail and just let me know if you'd be interested. And we've got a call tomorrow actually. Um, with some state um, leadership um, and also some folks from SAMHSA at the um, uh, Center of Excellence for African-American um, Behavioral Health, which is a new uh, center that SAMHSA is now funding. So I'll put that information in the chat. Thank you so much, Lori. And um, if you all wanna connect on that, just um, you know, follow up through the email address I'll put in the chat. Thank you. Thank you. So you can see y'all, a lot of us are working and we're trying to find each other and do better work and more meaningful work. And this has been an opportunity to do that. I want to thank Anne again for uh, giving us her expertise and the strong partnership that the peer community has with the Eye to Eye Center. Um, y'all, we're about to change some things in North Carolina and we're yes. just delighted for everybody who's gotten on and um, wish you health and peace in the weeks to come and stay tuned. We'll get links out if anybody's interested in our next meetings. Is that it? Anybody else got uh, Damien, Karen, Ann? Nope, thank you all oh. so much for sticking with us on this. Great meeting. I, I really appreciate this opportunity to see you all and talk to you. Thank you. Ann. Yeah. Ann. Yeah. Hi. Diane Corsand, the NAMI South yeah. Mountains, North Carolina. Thank you for the exceptional presentation. Thank I you. think that you're, you're exceptional in putting the information out there and it's how we're in taking it. I thought it was, um, I thought it was exceptional. I oh, also, thank you, Diane. I appreciate that. Absolutely. And um, we, we um, I, I think I'm taking away from this and I think that we have a NAMI smart um, for advocacy, changing hearts, changing minds. I think it would be very cohesive for it to flow right in what you're doing. In saying that, it, it, gives, it gives everybody the tools that they need how to talk to the legislators, the senators. Um, I mean, we... Um, uh, uh, Ms. Childers and myself, we do this just as free of charge. And I'm just saying that because with what you're doing and what we're doing, I think that this can be, um, can be really great. And um, I hope that people will, will uh, reach out and um, let's build the partnership. This is the starting. They're bringing yes. this to our attention, and this is the starting point and how we need to go about doing it. So thank you, ladies. Exceptional. Well, I hope everybody has a great day, and whatever you're going to get with weather, that you stay safe and warm. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.
Take care, everybody. Have a Thank great you, weekend. Everybody. God bless you. Bye, everybody. Thank, Thank you for joining us. Nice presentation. Have a great day, everyone. You too. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. I just realized I was writing a lot of messaging to people, including Obi Johnson, and it was all going to Prince Moses and Thank you. everybody. Thank you. <laughs> or Mr. Moses. Thank Obi. you. Nice presentation. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I'm I'm gonna get going. Thanks, Thank Anne. you all. See ya. Bye, Obi, yeah. stay on a second, please. Thank you. Do we get certificates? No, you don't. We, we, we did not. We don't have the staffing or the resources to uh, promise um, education units. OK, thank you. Thank you. So, Obi, I left you a voicemail or a text, but you have multiple phone numbers sometimes. So it may not have been on the right number, but I also left you an email, I think, and and I, I think it was the uh, the wfu.edu email. But we're going to have a meeting next week for um, of a handful of folks about considering a strategy for 